I think creators are influencing everything we do, right? Yeah. <laughs> and food, you know, what we wear, like how we style our spaces at home, even, you know, how we want to feel or engage, you know, and I, if you think about, um, if you watch a lot of food content, if there's even rituals in like, how I'm going to drink my coffee or what mm -hmm. I'm going to do. And I think that people want the experience and they fall in love with these people because they're giving them great information that they can trust. Welcome to Creators with Influence, a podcast by the American Influencer Council on the intersection between the creator economy and digital culture. For the month of April, AIC's Summer Albarsha takes over as host of Creators with Influence podcast to spotlight the immensely talented and multidimensional American Muslim creator community. Presenting This is Ramadan, our collective voices and stories. Summer Albarsha is a globally recognized fashion expert and is considered one of the pioneers of the digital modest fashion movement. Ramadan Karim, I'm Samar Albarsha, your guest host of the Creators with Influence podcast. My takeover continues with Alia Kemet, who is the Senior Vice President of Global Creative and Digital Transformation at McCormick & Company. Last year, Alia was named Adweek's Brand Leader of the Week and was part of the 2021 Class of Ads Leading Woman. This is Ramadan is a program that I'm proud to lead for the American Influencer Council that recognizes the accomplishments of the Arab American and Muslim creator community. The council strives to promote inclusion by generating public goodwill for the diverse voices and storytellers that make up the creator economy. In this episode, Alia and I will discuss how food culture can create unity, generational traditions, and why community is essential. Hi, Alia. Thanks so much for coming on the show. You have such an incredible background. Tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself. Thank you, Summer. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be having this conversation with you um, and Ramadan Kareem to everybody out there. You know, I've been in the this marketing industry um, and also as a kind of a content creator um, for brands for my entire career. So almost um, going to date myself, but about 25 years. Wow. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I've been with McCormick for the last five years, which has been tons of fun because there is just nothing more fun than food, right? Yeah. Um, and previous to that, I was with uh, IKEA doing some similar roles with uh, content and creativity and in the digital space for about 14 years there. So um, it's been quite a journey. Um, I'm a mom. and That's amazing. Uh, yeah, I got a uh, four kids, so <laughs> nice. And you know. so your your hands hands are full, Absolutely. you know, all around. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. so amazing. You know, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to speak to you. So I'm gonna go ahead and get into our first question, which yeah. thanks to Arabic spice merchants sailing to spice producing lands, the spice trade began in the Middle East over four thousand years ago. McCormick spices have been in kitchens since eighteen eighty nine. Flavor, as we know, is essential to many people because McCormick did $6 billion in annual sales in 2021, a 13% increase from the prior year. McCormick is getting ready to put out the 22nd edition of the Flavor Forecast. So what food trends can you share with us that are on your radar? Yeah, Summer, we love the Flavor Forecast. I don't know if you know, but we've been putting it out for, well, this will be our 22nd year. And we, um, just kind of an example of some of the things we find out or we discover in flavor trends is um, a really good one. This is an old one, but um, a lot of people don't know that McCormick actually discovered um, pumpkin spice. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, so every time you're having your pumpkin spice latte, you can thank McCormick for that. Um, and then over the last kind of couple of decades, we put out this really great kind of food report that mm -hmm. celebrates not just food culture, but also like the trends that we're seeing. And so this 22nd edition, there's a few kind of themes that I'm really excited about. Um, one of the first themes is around time as a luxury ingredient. And it's really all about like how we're either savoring time um, in food preparations or like think about like pickling or fermenting or canning, curring, how all of that is coming back um, and really kind of taking uh, sitting in the forefront. Um, and there's some really kind of cool recipes that are going to be in the floor, uh, in the forecast um, that support that or making things that are going to save you time, like one pot dishes or, you yeah. know, quick things like that. Um, and then another theme, um, there's like there's like three themes, but the, I'm going to jump to kind of I'm not going to give them all away. So maybe people can check out uh, the, the flavor forecast. But one I love 
is all about um, how we're celebrating the power of women um, mm -hmm. and the stories um, and the contributions of women to food culture. Um, yeah. And it's really cool because of this flavor forecast, we're actually celebrating and highlighting highlighting an Egyptian woman um, who has this really cool kind of concept restaurant in the Maryland area. It's called um, um, uh, Koshiri Corner. Um, and her name is Iman Musa. Yeah. And this is like a really cool um, kind of like Egyptian street food concept. Um, it's amazing. So it's, it's really cool. And I mean, even you can see through like Google searches that so many people are searching for like Egyptian um, dishes. And so just like all of this kind of um the cultures of from different communities like more yeah. people who are not of those communities want to try them that's amazing and i also think too as you said time is one of the biggest luxuries especially when it comes to the kitchen so you know it's such a cool um theme to recognize i want to continue on and ask you a little bit about uh, you led the launch of Sunshine Seasoning, an all-purpose seasoning created in partnership with TikTok's favorite chef, Tabitha Brown. This was McCormick's first influencer innovation collaboration through social media and direct-to-consumer. So what inspired this collaboration and why do you think it was successful? Yeah, um, so, you know, if you think back to the beginning of the pandemic, it's like all you're doing is looking at your phone, right? And how many mm -hmm. of us are on TikTok and we're at home and we're cooking and we're getting inspired and we're getting all of these recipes. And our team, we're, we kind of discovered or found out about Tabitha Brown with like the rest of the world and like fell mm -hmm. in love with her. And we were like, oh my goodness, we really need to partner with her. And and we did. And so the first time we did just like, a, it was a live event just and she cooked and our consumers loved her. But then we wanted to do something bigger and actually do this kind of collab product. And it's not an easily done thing, but it sold out in 39 minutes, the sunshine seasoning. Wow. Crazy. <laughs> and, That's and amazing. It, but it's the insights, right? It's the fact yeah. that we know how powerful influencers are. We know mm -hmm. that like people who are on TikTok or on Instagram are literally in your kitchen with you when you're cooking. Yeah. And we wanted to be a part of that. Um, and so I think brands more and more are looking for ways to do that authentically and organically so it, it doesn't feel like forced. And yeah. we just let Tabitha be herself. We, we literally, it was like a whole new way of innovating because usually when you do innovation, you don't say, hey, you can make anything you want. Yeah, and just be yourself. And that yourself. usually it's like super curated. Yeah. <laughs> and I also yeah. feel too, it's so interesting because with taste, you have to really trust the influencer that is selling right. the product because you can't taste it via camera as you can see clothing you can see makeup but like with taste selling out of a seasoning is definitely incredible um and all thanks to the power of social media 100 percent, you know and her followers right like yeah. these people who are invested in tabitha brown um so it was it was great we were so super excited about it that's so awesome. So as we're talking, there's such a unique food culture on social media, particularly on TikTok and Instagram, and you can see that food brings people together. Why do you think food creators are influencing what we eat now? Yeah, I think I think creators are influencing everything we do, right? Yeah. <laughs> and food, you know, what we wear, like how we style our spaces at home, even, you know, how we want to feel or engage, you know, and I, if you think about, um, if you watch a lot of food content, if there's even rituals in like how I'm going to drink my coffee or what mm -hmm. I'm going to do. And I think that people want the experience and they fall in love with these people because they're giving them great information that they can trust. And mm -hmm. I think that, that um, I think it, I think it's critical and I think it's just as important, if not more important, really than what than what brands have to say. Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think I think we now go to social media for recipes. I mean, I do, and I'm and oh, I work. Yeah. I work in food, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and I also think too, there's like this trend of romanticizing your life. And so something yeah. as um, like daily routine as cooking now can feel like a fun event or something right. special when you're finding a new recipe. Like for example, me branching out of making Syrian food every day. I'm yeah. like, oh my God, I found this recipe from another country. I'm gonna like sit and enjoy every moment of every part of the recipe and just feel yeah. like a change. So mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, social media, um, the Sorry, I feel like the food trends really do help people feel like their routine is something special and not simply for the sake of eating. 
Exactly. And don't you think it's bringing people, like it brings cultures together too, because oh yeah, where I make a really mean, like Korean style kind of like, you know, drippy oh, yeah. <laughs> rice bowl. Now my daughter's like, mm-hmm. that's not authentic. I said, no, but it's inspired. <laughs> oh yeah. And you know, I think it's just an ode to all of the cultures when you right. try making their recipes. You know, I feel like that's a whole other debate too, but I definitely right. feel like it's cultural appreciation um, when you're totally trying to make their foods, um, yeah. especially the whole salmon bowl trend. I hopped mm-hmm. on that. Emily Mariko, mm-hmm. we've all heard of her um, yeah. starting to use the sushi paper in your existing salmon bowl leftovers. Yeah. So there's definitely innovative uh, trends that also, you know, come out of making leftovers and other ways mm-hmm. to be more efficient in the kitchen as well. Not always extremely time consuming. So as we're discussing, you know, food and social media, research suggests that we're more likely to engage with photos of fast food, according to Ethan Panzer, a professor of marketing at St. Mary's University in Canada. How can we normalize eating healthy on social media? No, I think that's a great question. Um, You know, maybe that's an American thing. Yeah. The research, because I think there's a lot of um, fresh food, um, when you look at a lot of different cultures and, and you look around the world, I do think that showing food that's fresh, um, I'm going to give a shout out to herbs and spices. <laughs> I think <laughs> that when you're using herbs and spices, you know, to increase the flavor in foods, that's a really great way to normalize healthy food. And I think coming up with quick uh, ways to make food healthy or quick dishes. I think people think of cooking from scratch is going to be so time consuming. Yeah. But, you know, recipes that have less than five ingredients, right, are going to feel much more approachable. That's one of the things we make. I mean, 80% of the content that um, my team makes, we we make it ourselves, our content we in, in the studio. And we try not to make it so complicated for people. So it's much more approachable and we use a lot yeah. of fresh ingredients. And I think that that really does help. Yeah, I also do feel like there is a movement towards more healthy foods being more appealing on social media. You know, you see people's nine to five routines involving like a green smoothie and all of these workout um, opportunities. And so I just feel like there is that movement towards healthier foods being more appealing. And I also think that um, just to be frank, Americans are starting to season their food. Um, <laughs> so growing up, you know, when you would have vegetables in a restaurant, it would be steamed broccoli with like absolutely nothing on it, straight up steamed broccoli. And it was giving the image that vegetables have to be boring. Whereas in my household, growing up in a Syrian household, we ate vegetables all the time and they were having mm-hmm. garlic, lemon, mint. Like we always had seasoning. And I never questioned vegetables as being plain yeah. because that's just not how I grew up. And so I do do think that a uh, trend is changing. I think seasoning is becoming yeah. very popular, very mm-hmm. available in most people's households. And uh, yeah, I agree. I and think it, that's huge. Yeah. And I think in turn, it promotes eating healthier as well, because you realize not everything needs to be f- double fried to be good. Exactly. Even though it's, it can be pretty good if it's fresh. I mean, of course, yeah. But sometimes when you don't feel good after you eat yeah. something, then you start to dissociate it being good. And even that, you need to season and you need to add, you know, add your flavor. And I, I can relate to what you're saying. You know, I mean, I think African-American culture is very similar. I mean, we, it's what I call um, layer flavors. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of layering of seasonings, a lot of layering of flavors. It's like, we don't just use garlic powder. It's like garlic powder, yeah. garlic, <laughs> salt, and fresh garlic. Paprika, you know? everything, and yeah. All, all, all the things. So um, I de- definitely think that that, that, that helps. Um, and then there is a movement to get away from so much processed food, too. I yeah, mean, of think course. about processed foods and sugar and what does that done and when you do to the body. Um, and there's so much conversation, especially with, like, younger people about mental health. And I think that that is also encouraging the fresher foods um, as well. There's definitely a lot of transparency and information when it comes to non-GMO, you know, pasteurized versus all of that. And so I feel like there's no, there's no reason for your average person that has access to the internet to not be educated on these topics now, or just at least not have heard of them at this point. It's not like in the nineties and eighties where people were being given processed foods as like completely normal. Um, I definitely remember the way I was growing up is completely different than now when it comes to even choosing my groceries. Um, And so that's just something I also want to instill in myself to implement for my future kids and make sure uh, we're all making healthy, you know, choices. (laughs) Yes. So 
So on the topic of Ramadan, since it is Ramadan, many people think that this month is about abstaining from food and drink, but it is actually a time for reflection, service to others, and uplifting family traditions. And what traditions are meaningful to you and your family? Yeah, I, I love that question. I was really thinking about it. Um, and I think it changes as the ages of your children change. So um, my I have my kids are older now, so I have a I have an 11 year old to a 20 year old. And I remember when my little, my youngest started fasting and for her Ramadan was the time that you get up in the middle of the night. And she mm -hmm. loved that because you, you eat in the middle of the night, like this, this <laughs> idea of that. And there is something special about that for young children. And so I think it's important to establish, um, you know, tradition so they can like feel the, um, you know, the blessing of the month and the excitement of the month. Um, yeah. You know, one thing we do is try to decorate, you know, the house. And I didn't really grow up decorating the house. This is more of a new tradition. I think that um, we have, my parents didn't really do it. Yeah. Um, but now we're really doing decorating the house. And there's so many great places. Like, I mean, just, I think my, like, we have this um, really cool um, uh, reef that says Ramadan Mubarak and our family name on mm -hmm. Our door, front door, and my so husband cute. actually ordered it, and I was like, "Oh my god, is my husband on Etsy now?" So <laughs> you know, but I think, um, and he's like really big on like the the Ramadan decorations, um, yeah. and so so I think that's one of the things. Um, of course, food traditions, you you gotta have it. Like they're expecting certain things that we're gonna, yeah. cook, you know, during Ramadan, um, and then. Also, obviously, like, you know, you want to make sure that you're doing things like, you know, going to the masjid. It's been a lot harder, I think, with um, COVID times. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are going. Um, I've been a little more cautious um, about going out around a lot of people. But um, I think those are kind of a few of the, the ones I think that are, are really important. Um, and then just involving the children in like the, the prep part. Yeah. Or even getting up for Sahur. Like, I'm like, why should I? just because i'm like the woman like why should i be the only one doing this i'm like no come on get up and uh <laughs> make you your doing? make your breakfast yeah, make it together right yeah. like you know i think i grew up and i remember my mom when we woke up like it was done and you know i'm a working mom and i think that the family should be a part of it um and mm -hmm. so and, and i see the kids they like to be a part of it so that's yeah that's really nice. Last year, That's my really husband nice. started making sahur. Like, I mean, girl, 22, I don't know how long I've been married, long time, 22 or 23 years in. But look, I was, he got <laughs> there and maybe it took, you know, a couple decades, but. <laughs> oh my God. That's so nice. You know, actually in my household, we don't have like this communal sahur. And I think it's because everyone has different work commitments. For example, yeah. like my husband, he has to wake up for work an hour after Sahur. So he's literally mm -hmm. waking up, having like two dates water and trying to like sleep that one hour left till he has to get up at six for work. So he's like, okay. just don't talk to me. Pretend I'm still, I'm just trying not to break my sleep. Like he's, yeah. he's yeah. like that. But then on the weekends, it's different, you know, but during yeah. the weekday, it's like barely anything. Uh, but then in the evenings, we'll have like a four course meal like you know there will always be lentil soup and something yeah. crispy a main dish salad like just to feel like it's different we'll sit on the nicer tables use our nicer silverware mm -hmm. even if it's just the two of us i've been married for four years now so you know we're trying to establish like these household traditions that will last for our children yeah. and just make it special even though we're not like with all of our family I, no, I love that idea of actually sitting at the nice table. Are you guys doing that during the week too? Or just yeah, on the every day. I like that. I'm going to make yeah. everybody sit at the dining room table tonight and not just in mm -hmm. the kitchen. And they're going to be like, what yeah. are we talking about? This is how summer does it. I know. <laughs> We're like, why are we saving our nice china for like guests that come twice a year? We're going to yeah. use it in this month. So that's it. something I started doing. I feel like it's pretty fun. You know, it's different. Mm -hmm. And again, when we're in St. Louis with both of our families, we'll usually have potluck dinners. We'll go to the mosque together to pray tarawih um, yes. and really just try to make the most out of the month. You know, I just remembered one. Um, and my mom started this tradition, which was, and I, this is a good one, I think, for as the kids grow up and people move away. Um, when you were talking about your family coming back together, my mom had four kids. So mm -hmm. she, and we're all, you know, out of the house, of course. So she wanted us to 
on the first day of Ramadan to all have iftar together, like all mm-hmm. her kids, which is really, really hard to, to do, you know, yeah. cause like it could be in the middle of the week or whatever. And so we were really good at this before the pandemic and then we got away from it. But this year we did do like, we got together as our families. I think it was like the second day, but it's really nice um, because yeah. it was like the kids are like their other cousins are there and mm-hmm. it's just pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, of course. And I feel like, you know, you don't get to see much family throughout the whole year. So then you should make an effort in the month to at least break your fast together with them. And I feel like there's also more reward, too, in breaking your fast with other people. And even in Islamically, like sharing a date to someone who's breaking their fast, you'll get the reward of their fast. Um, Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's just a great time to be around family. And that kind of takes us into our second question, which is the end of Ramadan is marked by a celebration known as Eid al-Fitr, or the feast of breaking the fast. How do you celebrate this occasion of gratitude? Well, more food. Now, I'm just yeah. kidding. Um, but yeah, food is like a thing, right? Um, so a couple things. Uh, I think this came from being younger. My mom used to always make our Eid outfits. Um, and so we would match and we would so like, sweet. it was so sweet. I, I mean, I don't have time to like make our eat outfits one year though. Yeah. I did do, um, and like, and the kids were like, grown, like people are grown, grown. And I had everybody's outfits made so that we all match, like the whole family matched. Um, I do try to make my family kind of sort of match for a day. Like, I think it's very lovely. You take that picture yeah. that come together. So that's kind of a tradition. Um, you know, and so, and the girls get excited and, uh, you know, to do henna. So we do henna and there's usually always wait, like eat bazaars at the masjid or so yeah. we'll do things like that. Again, though, we try to find a time for the extended family. And I think this is the benefit. And we don't think about this. I, I w- will say this. I think those of us, we have Muslim families, people who like have reverted or who are in this country and don't have Muslim families. I think sometimes, you know, it's harder for them. Oh, yeah. You know, in that regard. So um, it's just something to think about. Like, how do you bring in your friends who don't have Muslim family? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, especially and uh, also in my situation as well, we uh, have this family and friend open house in our house. So we just make it like a potluck. Everyone is invited, you know, your family, their friends, they can bring their friends just for all of us to get together. We usually do it in our backyard. And my mom is extremely active in our mosque. You know, she's constantly actually um, taking part in like interfaith lectures and she's always making new friends, especially friends who have reverted to Islam. And so um, I remember growing up, we constantly made new friends and trying to invite them and include them in our celebrations. And of course, it's hard like when you when I like am away and I'm not always around our mosque in my hometown to be able to connect with like, you know, girls my age who may be lonely in this time. But I think there's definitely uh, been more awareness when it comes to that. And a lot of mosques are doing their best to uh, have celebrations for those who don't have families. Our mosque, for example, hosts an iftar every single night and it's sponsored by uh, a donor in the community. It'll be a restaurant catered iftar. And it's, uh, for example, a great place for single or um, people without families to come and have a communal dinner together. So I think definitely there could be more done for that as well. The other thing that we um, didn't touch on as much, but I see there's a lot of service happening also in Ramadan. Um, And we did a, I did a service project with my Girl Scouts. I have a Girl Scout um, troop. I'm an advisor. I've been in Girl Scouts like 10 years. And so it's a Muslim Girl Scout group. That's Um, so cute. uh, It's so cute. And they're so great. We were like, okay, so what do you want to do for this month? And they were like, they want to do a service project. And they did a period drive. So where you collect, um, you know, menstruation products for women Mm -hmm. and girls who don't have access. And it was like really powerful to do and give back during, and they did the flyer and like the whole thing. And these are girls like sixth to eighth um, eighth grade. Um, And so, yeah, I was like, I thought it was important to do it during Ramadan because you know that your blessings are gonna be amplified if you do it. Month. Yeah. And of course, in that age group, too, that's what they're going through. Exactly. So yeah. it's nice for them to recognize like they have a privilege that they have access to these products yeah. and a lot of girls don't. Um, and just in that, you know, that time of their life, I think that's so important. Yeah. I also Fair do want to. <laughs> yeah, that's so sweet. Yeah. 
I think it's so important to take part in service during this month. And especially, I remember volunteering in our mosque as well and making food boxes and handing them out to families. Uh, before iftar time, they'd have, we'd have like a drive up. So they would actually just come out in front of the mosque in their car and you'd hand them, you'd ask how many people are in your family and you'd hand them that many boxes of like rice and chicken or whatever recipes they had uh, going on for the week. And again, it was also donated by community members or restaurants in the area. And I think, you know, it's just really important to include everyone and make sure your, your neighbors are being fed. I love that. Exactly. <laughs> just to kind of wrap our final question, what are some timeless recipes you always find yourself preparing during Ramadan? Well, I'm going to give another shout out to my mother. Um, I don't make this as much, but you brought up lentil soup. And there is something about lentil soup um, in mm -hmm. every single culture, I think. Um, I remember eating lentil soup for Suhoor and for Iftar. So, yeah. and I just think that's great. And then when I was, um, I, and I did that growing up in an African-American household, I remember being in Morocco and it was like the same, it was like lentil soup. And so um, lentils in general are just super powerful. <laughs> and I think that's like a great um, food to take you through the day when, when you're fasting. So that's one. I do lentil tacos. So that's my new twist on it. Yeah, wow. it's so easy. You use the tacos like they're like um, a vegetarian meat. You can use um, McCormick uh, taco seasoning and mm -hmm. it's like amazing. And so your taco Tuesday is lentil tacos. So I'll do that. I <laughs> do. It, it's great. I do um, kind of like a I do like a soul food, like a vegan vegetarian style soul food theme meal. And my family loves that. Um, That's so cool. What, 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 what are the ingredients you use? So I'll use barbecue. It'll be like a barbecue tofu instead mm -hmm. of like a barbecue chicken. Gotta have yeah. a mac and cheese because, you know, we do. Um, and, uh, you know, like greens and like, a, you know, I'll do like more of a, like a Caribbean style rice and peas dish. Love that. Um, and then my favorite one, which I don't need my kids to hear this because I haven't made it yet this Ramadan and I <laughs> think I'm going to need to do it. Yeah. Is, um, like a Trinidadian bus up shut. So if you've ever had like, it's like a roti, but uh -huh. the Trinidadian style roti, I swear is the, and I'm not from Trinidad, but like I had, I learned from like Trinidadian women. Yeah. And it is the best. I think their roti is like hands down the best roti ever. Cause it's like Indian yeah. influenced. Indian and Caribbean, Caribbean influenced. It's, 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 yeah. it's so good. So that, and then I'll do like a chickpea dish and a uh, pumpkin that type of kind of like yeah. an Afghani one, but this is this is Trinidadian. Um, so those are some, and then and this is so you as you can tell, I borrow from many different places. Um, Love that the S Somalians and their sambusa, and like just sambusa is like Ramadan, right? Like to yeah. like if, you, if you have <laughs> grown up around like Somalian people, and so I will make my own version, which is more of like a vegetarian sambusa style, and. And my kids love it. Well, that's so amazing that, you know, you get to cook so many different yeah. cultural foods. And I'd love to have dinner with you one day. Yeah, <laughs> Try that. I'm craving now all of these Caribbean flavors yeah. that you're talking about. And I feel like I need to break away from the Middle Eastern cuisine I've been having for quite some time. So I think that's a great, great start. Well, anyway, with all this food talk, I'm looking forward to breaking the fast. And I want to thank you so much, Alia, for your time today. And please tell our listeners how they can connect with you on social. Sure. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm really easy. There's no nicknames or I'm just Aliyah Kemet, A-L-I-A -A, and then Kemet, K-E-M-E-T on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Amazing. Well, I'm Samar al -Bursha, and thank you again for joining us for the This is Ramadan, which is presented by the AIC's Learning and Development Committee. I hope you all have a blessed day. Creators with Influence is produced by the American Influencer Council. The sole 501c6 not-for-profit trade association in the U.S. created by and for career creators. This is a podcast spotlight. Phenomenal Grit, career conversations for women of color, is the go-to for inspiring you to tap into your personal magic, navigate challenges, crush it at work, advance in your career, and find joy doing it. Listen on Audible, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music.